and welcome everybody to Between Rounds here on Heavy.com. I'm Ken Gonzalez along with my co-host here, the coach Sean Tompkins, right and of course Dave Heise. You're all familiar with Dave from the, uh, the radio show. Now you get a chance to look at it. So this is the huge UFC 113 preview show. First one on the, uh, the docket here right now, Leota Machida, Mauricio Shogun Hua, the huge rematch. Uh, they fought in Los Angeles at UFC 104. Leoto got the victory. I didn't really think he did. Sean, you were there. You said that I was crazy, that he did. But, uh, you know, Sean, we're going to get to the technical side of it here in just a second. But, Dave, break this down. You know, wh what are we going to expect to see here? Well, the bottom line here is, like, like you said, Ken, it was a very close fight. Whether we, whether we give it to Leoto, we give it to Shogun, it was a close fight. But I think the most important, the most important thing here is, is that Shogun showed the first way to counter the karate of Machida because previously every single guy that fought him was just dominated but Shogun proved that he had the skills and he had the game plan that could work against the karate in the cage and so this rematch is going to be pretty interesting. Right a exactly now Sean what exactly does Shogun have to do what was that little piece that he didn't do the first time that's going to make a difference here? Well I think first of, first and foremost it's we have to look at what worked for him and what worked for him was his leg kicks you know, the damage that he did to the legs of Machida, even sometimes changing it up to the body kick, you know, I think that's really what we've got to look at in this fight. He's got to go back to that. He's got to continue to pressure Machida. And I think really to make a change in this fight, we have to see a change in Machida. Because we've seen before Machida's that, that stylistically, that karate, that very traditional style that he does, that forward and back motion. But he generally runs and he doesn't box. And what we need to see is we need to see from him to come in and to be able to learn how to change it up and not just be that one style, but be able to change into a boxer or a kickboxer. Um, because we know Shogun, Shogun's been doing this for a long time. He's, he's very formidable on the ground. He's, he's not scared to throw jump kicks. Um, and he'll chase you down whenever, whenever the chance rises. Right. And, and, you know, one of the questions going in also, not just about the fight itself or the technicalities of the fight, but we look at the Anderson Silva fight, even some people say the George St. Pierre fight, a little bit lackluster. Is UFC going to be in a little bit of trouble if these guys come out and perform for five rounds and it's just a so-so game? Dave? Well, if you saw the first fight, I mean, they went after each other. Leota ran a little bit, but I think it was the leg kicks that Sean was talking about. But this time around, Shogun wants it. I think he's hungry, and I think that's going to be, he's going to push the pace of the fight, and I think that's going to be what it's going to take to win the fight for Shogun. Right. I think that there, you've got to look at it from both sides of the table. First of all, when you're a fighter like Shogun, who it was so close he could have had that victory in that title, he could go back to camp and, and be re-motivated and build and work harder, you know, and, and maybe come up with those little mistakes that he made that could have capitalized and made it all work out for him. You know, on the other hand, Machida's got to come back and say, listen, I can't just squeak by a victory again. I have to go out there and dominate. Obviously, every fight we've seen that's been in the, in the championship realm lately has been a gamble for the UFC. Machida knows he's got to go out there. He's got to prove himself. And he's got to, he's got to pressure Shogun. Well, can Machida dominate Shogun? Is it possible? I think, uh, I think that he's going to have to change his style to do it. If he goes out and he's the normal Machida that he's been, Absolutely not. He's too defensive. He counter punches too much. Um, and Shogun's always going to be ahead of him. The crowd is going to want to see in this rematch, they're going to want to see a clean, decisive victory, not somebody running from another fighter and just outscoring him. Now, you mentioned the leg kicks in the first fight. Do you think that that's going to be another key to success for Shogun this time around? See, that's always a tough question, especially for myself as a coach's point of view, because I know the, show, the Shoguns probably saw that and knew that it worked for him, but at the same time, time, Machida has went home and said, okay, where did I lose this fight? Well, he lost the fight on leg kicks. So he's going to probably be working on how to capitalize on defending the leg kick, timing the leg kick, and just finding a way to get away from it. So um, I think that still it's going to be a, a factor in the fight because that's always been one of Shogun's biggest weapons. Um, but I'm sure that, uh, that Machida is going to also have a, have a way to, to capitalize on going against it. And how do you counter those leg kicks? I mean, it seems like everyone's been landing them lately in MMA. It's such an important part of the game. It's such an important part of the keys to have, having success. What does he need to do to not get hit by so many? Well, he, he's really, he's got to learn how to block the leg kick, <laughs> you know, and, and, and not right. just take it, not just run from it. 
in order to get somebody to stop kicking you in the leg, you block it because a shin to shin strike hurts. Right. And if you have that pain, mentally you're not gonna throw it as often. Absolutely. And, uh, and I really think that, uh, that, that Machida's gonna have to, add, he's gonna have to add that in his defensive arsenal. Definitely. Now obviously Shogun had a reputation before he came to the UFC. Uh, the first fight he had was a bit lackluster. Uh, is this the Shogun of, of before? Is Shogun, has he arrived finally? I think that uh, after seeing him in his last couple fights, he's, he's slowly getting to the Shogun that we knew from the Pride days. He had a rough start, um, but I see him actually transferring into the UFC better than most fighters have. You know, he, he's found himself. He's found that aggressive Pride style that, you know, we all have learned to love. And I think what also was a problem for Shogun in the beginning, other than, you know, fighting off some injuries, was he had to deal with the rule changes. He was used to having, he could do soccer kicks, he could do all right. these things that in America or in MMA here, you're not allowed to do. So that being said, it took him some time to transition into the game. And I think that now that he's got that down, that also has brought him back to the level he was at. Right. Agreed. Yeah, no. I mean, let, let's just look at the history of, you know, it, from pride fighters moving into the UFC that are in the same, were in the same camp that Shogun is, rolls with or rolled with and the shooter box and uh, let, most of their victories came from soccer kicks or, or head stomps, you know. Yeah. You take that out of their game and, uh, you know, now we, we have to see a Shogun that's transferred into the Shogun that the UFC really right. needs and that we deserve. When we come back, right here on Between Rounds, we're going to discuss Josh Koscheck with a victory. Might he have to face one of his buddies? So we'll find out when we come back right here on Between Rounds. And welcome back, everybody, to Between Rounds here on Heavy.com. We're talking UFC 113, which is this Saturday, May the 8th, at the Bell Center in Montreal, Canada. We've had some fun times in Montreal. We've been there a few times. You know, it's a good town. Good to go back to Canada, right? Uh, great to go back to Canada. In Montreal, I've spent a big part of my fighting career up there, and I've uh, got a lot of fans, a lot of uh, friends in Montreal. I can't wait to get back there and see them. Dave met a lot of friends last time in Montreal, too, so <laughs> he can say so. I did, for sure. When you go to Canada, you're going to meet a lot of friends. I mean, that's the Canadian people. That's the way it is there. That's where they are. They're Canadian. They're known for being nice? <laughs> yeah, they're known for being too nice. <laughs> All right, so last segment, we wrapped up the, uh, the Shogun uh, Machida fight. Now we want to talk Josh Koscheck, Paul Daly, and, you know, the intriguing thing about this fight, of course, is if Koscheck wins, would Dana White want to now pair his next fight with John Fitch? So, Dave? Well, I see it as it's either a number one contender bout, so he either gets the title shot with a victory, or it's, if not, he's definitely got to fight someone like a Fitch. He's got to be up there to get the number one contender bout. But I really think at this point, this fight will be for who fights George St. Pierre next. I just don't see how else it could be anything else. Well, I just, Sean, you, well, yeah, I mean, a, a number one contender fight, I think maybe makes more sense than giving him the title shot right away. Well, Again. Yeah, I mean, and, and especially Dana White's been talking about it forever, about how he, he, it's time that fight, fight camps are going to have to go against each other. Right. You know, so with the cost check versus Fitch, it's going to make a lot of sense if it's coming from Dana's talk. Now, my biggest thing is I don't think anybody sh should look past Paul Daly. Well, that's what I was... And I think, personally, I think it's a horrible matchup for Josh Koscheck. You know, I think... He's a strong guy. I think he's a strong guy. He has great takedown defense. And uh, let's face it, he's probably, I think, the most dynamic striker in the UFC. Right. If he puts his hands on Josh Koscheck, who has been knocked out before, he's knocking him out again. Now, for Koscheck, why does it seem that he's abandoned his origins? Why does it seem that wrestling is just not even a factor of his game anymore when, especially in this fight, I think the only way he does have a chance of winning this fight is if he goes back to those roots and he sticks with the wrestling and he takes Daly off his feet where Daly's most vulnerable. Right, well, I mean, if history proves itself, Josh Koscheck isn't gonna do that though. <laughs> you know, and, and, and I think that uh, Koscheck has kind of fallen into that that um, idea, and he's even said it himself, that he's not, he's not necessarily chasing a title. He's more chasing big fights. Right. He loves MMA, he loves to fight, and he wants to beat guys at their own game. Right. Big mistake when it com comes to Paul Daly. Paul Daly, anyways, I think, like I said before, has great takedown defense. Koscheck, don't get me wrong, is probably one of the best wrestlers in the UFC. Used to be, anyways. Right. We haven't exactly. seen it in a while. But uh, <laughs> Paul Daly, he could stop a takedown, and like I said, he puts his hands. If, if Josh wants to trade with him, 
bad guy to trade with. He's traded with great, great stand-up guys. I mean, I, I've seen him fight guys like Dwayne Ludwig, who's 10 times the striker that Josh Koscheck will ever right. be, and make him look like it was his first day of kickboxing. Right, well, since coming to the UFC, Paul Daly, it's 2-0 and with two knockout wins over Dustin Hazlett, Martin Campman, two, I mean, tough fighters at that. So, Paul Daly, some may say, well, if this is a number one contender bout, you're getting it kind of early. Well, maybe not. He's, talk he's taken out the top competition, and this against Josh Koscheck, it makes sense. Absolutely, it does. And we got to look at, you know, maybe in the UFC, we don't know a lot about him, but I, I mean, I've, I've looked before. I think the kids had close to 28 professional fights. Absolutely. And a lot of those fights were wins, <laughs> a lot more than losses. Exactly. So, Well, you know, for Daly coming into this fight with the hint of underdog, you know, to him, not many people are going to look to Daly to win this fight. Uh, does Koscheck have enough in his camp to switch things around to prepare himself properly? I think that Josh Koscheck, Koscheck sorry, has that, uh, the, the, the options in his camp, absolutely. Do I think he'll use them? No, I, I just don't see it. I don't see him changing up anything that he's done for the past two or three fights. He's going to be the same Koscheck we've seen. And if he wins, he's getting lucky. If he doesn't win, he's getting taught a lesson. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the way it goes, right? right? Absolutely. I think that for Koscheck, I mean, I think his biggest... His biggest weakness is that mentality, is that confidence, no matter where he's, no matter who he's fighting, is that he's going to beat them at their game. And it comes a point when you got to be a professional. You've got to do what it takes to win a fight right. if you want to continue to be successful in the UFC. All right. Well, the next fight that uh, the coach might know a little something about, Sam Stout, favorite in Canada, of course. The last time in Montreal, the crowd went nuts. You guys were vaulted to, like, the co-main event, practically, I think, uh, on that one. Uh, how, was, how is it going? I mean, camp has been great. It, and it's, uh, I, I've told people this all, all month. It's, we're very fortunate that every camp for the last three, we've been able to say was better than the last. <laughs> yeah. Not too many people get to say that. We've been gifted with, uh, with, with the new training center, training at the Tapout Training Center in Las Vegas. We have a team of 24 fighters, some of the best in the world. And, uh, you know, as always, I brought in some of the, you know, key guys that I think are going to make a difference in Sam's training to beat a guy like Jeremy Stevens, a guy that we've respected and wanted to fight for a really long time. We know he's tough. We know he bangs. And, you know, we asked for this fight, you know, and we thank the UC for giving it to us. We're in Montreal, which is basically Sam Stout's hometown. And uh, we're going to go out there and hopefully put on a clinic. And, you know, I know the fans want to see it. We don't like to look that far ahead. But uh, fight of the night is always a great chance when you got a guy like uh, Sam Stout in there. Absolutely. Now, training Sam for this fight, you're fighting Jeremy Stevens, who he's a banger, like you said. And he's going to go out, and he's very much, he, he reminds me of like a Leonard Garcia. He goes out, and he throws big bombs, big strikes, and he tries to knock you out with every punch. I mean, is the key to this, like you said, is it just to be more technical and to just pick him apart? Well, I mean, that's going to be a big part of our game, being more technical than he is, um, using our range, our distance, and our movement. I think where, where people go wrong with Jeremy Stevens is they forget about the fact that he's not a bad wrestler. Right. And if you watch the Joe Lauzon fight, who we watched previously because we're preparing for him, right. if you watch it on the opposite side to look at Jeremy Stevens, he went for just as many submission attempts as, Jeremy, as Joe Lauzon did. Right. So, I mean, we're not overlooking that. We also know that he, he hits hard. Why? Because he's very strong. Yeah. And we have to keep that in mind. He is dangerous at all times. Jeremy Stevens believes in himself. And if history repeats itself, fighters that believe in themselves are dangerous fighters. No, obviously everybody knows Vitor Belfort, coach here by Sean Tompkins. Vitor's career is going well. You know, he's going to be coming back uh, from the injury. But now you've got Sam, and every fight now for Sam is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, you know, where, where does Sam see himself right now? Well, we don't, we're not looking ahead too far. Um, you know, people have been calling me, we've been talking to media all over the world. You know, uh, is he going to be in the running? Is he going to be in that title contention? A guy like Sam Stout, we've never been in a rush with. And I think that's why we're in this good position right now. We slowly build him. He's young. He's exciting. And he's quickly learning the game of mixed martial arts. Right. He's not just a kickboxer anymore. And we need that with a guy like Sam. We're in no rush. The UFC loves him. He loves the UFC. And uh, he's getting better and better every time. Jeremy Stevens is a good step. He's a good challenge. And, uh, and we'll go from there. All right. Right. No, I mean, it's going to be a great fight. I mean, I, I think so.
Uh, moving on, another Canadian, you know, is, is on this card. Patrick Cote, who again was battling a knee injury. Uh, has he actually fought since then? I don't think, no, he hasn't. I don't believe this will be his fought. first fight This is his first back. fight yeah. in nearly a year and a half, I believe, for Patrick Cote and, and you know, picking Alan Belcher. I mean, this could be a tough fight for him. Absolutely. I mean, I, Alan Belcher surprised us with Dennis Kang. Yeah. You know, there was a fight that, uh, you know, he was in over his head. You know, you've got a guy like De Dennis Kang that came out of Japan, was submitting all the top submission artists out there. And uh, Alan Belcher came out and he submitted Dennis King Absolutely. after completely controlling the entire fight. I think that for Alan Belcher will be the place where he can win. We know both guys can stand and trade. We know both guys are very te technical on their feet. But that X factor, I think, for Alan Belcher is he has the ability to go to the ground. And when he's on the ground, he knows what to do and he can finish the fight. Right. And for Cote... That's what I'd be most worried about. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I think Belcher, even in the stand-up game, I think has more to offer right. because he's a kickboxer. Right. Where Cote has shown us in the past, he's, he's a heavy-hitted puncher right. with a little bit of anti-wrestling. And I think in this fight, um, I think that it's going to be Alan Belcher's night. It's going to be another step for Alan. Really? So you're looking for Alan Belcher Absolutely, to, to come out on this one? Yep. Hometown crowd isn't going to sway Patrick Cote. No, I, and I think Cote's been out of, out of, um, out of commission for a while. Right. You know, you're out, you're out that long. You've got a guy like Ellen Belcher who's on a roll, coming off a huge fight, right. and showing us that he can do more. Right. And it's not like they gave him, right. Some of these guys that come off energy, energy injury, they give him a tomato can or something to warm him up. They're throwing him right in the fire. Right. But, but they can't do that with Patrick Cote because his last fight, even though he got hurt, was a title shot. Right. So, I mean, they can't throw him against a tomato can. They have to actually continue to test him. If he, if he was worthy of that title shot, he's got to prove it by taking out big guys when he comes sure, back. Absolutely, 100%. Sure. All right, there's one last fight that we've got to talk about that's on the, uh, the pay-per-view card. And what fight would be complete with it, without Kimbo Slice, Kimbo Slice and Matt Mitrone? I, I, you know, I mean, you're going to have to dissect this thing. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I, I think the poor man would have to say, well, Matron probably has more skills going into this fight than Kimbo Slice. Man, I look at it as they're almost, they're very equal in this fight. What, the, what I saw from Matron from the Ultimate Fighter show was a guy that can take a hit. And maybe that comes from his days in the NFL, but I mean, it's going to take a lot to knock that guy out. And a guy like Kimbo Slice, he loves to throw those big shots. He has been tested. His chin in the past has been questionable. So for... For Kimbo, I think the key for him is to not get hit by a big shot, is to keep his hands up, definitely, and uh, just do what he does. Because right. eventually, with a guy like Matrone, who seems pretty green in the sport, that could be the only way you're going to win, is just keeping it going. I'm going to have to look at this fight as like, this, this fight they finally put together, uh, a Kevin Ferguson, Kimbo Slice fight, where we know it's going to be a stand-up fight. Right. First of all, he's fighting a guy, Matt Matrione, who is much taller than him. Right. Taller guys don't shoot on shorter guys, right. you know? So it's not, he's not going to try to take the, the fight to the mat, you know? So we're going to have that chance to actually see them come, apart, come, come against each other and throw punches and kicks. Where I think the difference in, again, is that, that speed and that distance and that, that height that Matt has. And I think he's going to be able to use that long jab. I don't think he's going to be in a rush with a guy like Kimbo Slice. And I think he's going to pick him apart until Kimbo falls down. We've seen Kimbo go down to not probably the, the heaviest punch in, you know, right. in the world <laughs> you know, when he fought, what was it, Seth Petrozelli. Seth Petrozelli. Exactly. So I think that uh, Kimbo Slice is a huge draw. Um, I think his, his time in the UFC will be extended because he is Kimbo Slice. But I think Matt Mitrione is going to have a chance to kind of bring himself into the limelight. Does Matt Mitrione then have a chance to become a real UFC fighter? I don't know if I'm sold on that because I also saw some things in the show that uh, maybe weren't uh, that uh, portraying of, of, of an elite athlete, I guess. <laughs> and, um, you know, especially when it came to, to, to his emotional side and, and his mind control, he just he seemed to have some weaknesses there. Mind you, it is the Ultimate Fighter TV show. And, and you know, I've, I've trained many of those guys, and it, you can't always believe everything you see on TV. So, <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, it's going to take more than beating Kimbo Slice to sell me on him. Right. All right, so UFC 113 in Montreal should be a, a very good uh, fight card, a good pay-per-view. Everyone should run out and, and sign up and get it. Don't miss it. I think exactly. it's pretty much sold out to go and see it live. So. Yeah, I, I think the thir all three in Montreal uh, yeah. sold out like, uh, like within those, hours. Those Canadian fans, man. Exactly.
So when we come back, Sam Stout will be with us. So we'll talk to him, see how the training was going, and we'll be right back on Between Rounds here for Heavy.com. All right, welcome back to Between Rounds here on Heavy.com. And as we said, we got Sam Stout, UFC fighter, sitting uh, between Dave and I. And uh, Sam, you're going back to Montreal. Another back to one. Montreal yet again. It um, is. It's your home yeah. court. Yeah, it's pretty much like my home away from home. I've considered it that, to be that way for, uh, for a long time now. I, you know, I started up my pro MMA career there. And, uh, you know, it's always nice to go back. Exactly. And uh, your opponent this time, they, they seem to be getting a little tougher. And tougher for you, right? Well, that's you know, that the that's, the, that's the way it works. You know, you gotta <laughs> keep uh, keep fighting and keep improving and, and fighting better and better opponents and working your way up that ladder. So that's what I'm trying to do. You know, the last segment, Sean talked about how uh, you know you don't ever look past a fight or anything like that. But and I don't want to do that. But your career in general, um, are you pleased with? you know where you're at and how it's going and how it's yeah, progressing definitely you know definitely I, um, I started in the UFC at a pretty young age I, I did my first fight back in 2006 and at UFC 58 I was 21 years old um, so you know I've had some ups and downs in my career but um, you know I'm, I'm young enough that I can take it as take them as learning experiences and 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 you know grow from them and luckily I've been able to to keep my spot in the UFC and and uh, you know I'm, I'm learning, paying the same dues as a lot of guys, but only I'm doing it on a bigger stage. So that's right. the way I see it. And, you know, I think it's, it's working out well for me. Right. Now, going into this fight with Jeremy Stevens, as a fighter, fighting a guy that you have to be constantly worried about his knockout power, I mean, does that, how, mentally, how, does that change anything going into the fight? Does that, does it make, does that bigger concern than, you know, a guy like Joe Lau's on your last fight who's a submission guy? I mean, the not dealing with that. Um, it's not that I'm any more concerned about Jeremy Stevens than I was Joe Lo say Joe Lozon or one of my other opponents. It's um, a different type of concern, you know. I got something different to worry about, and, my, and you know, me and Sean have been working on that together, you know, on a different game plan. Um, there's always dangers in that cage, right. and uh, you know, this time it's just a different danger than the last <laughs> one. <laughs> right now. Obviously, both of you guys have the expertise in the striking, but for you, it's more technical striking. It's more crisp. Do you think that is definitely, if it does stay on the feet, that's going to be the key? Is just picking him apart? Yeah, I definitely think um, in this fight with me and with me and Jeremy, it's going to be, you know, I I, I have, have a feeling it's going to come down to striking, and I, what I think it's going to come down to is uh, is technical striking versus power punching, right. and uh, you know, hopefully my speed and my technical ability will. Uh, will allow me to prevail in this fight over his, you know, his pa raw power. Definitely. Sam, talk about this weight division, you know, in the UFC. Uh, do you consider it one of these divisions where there is absolutely no room for error whatsoever? Definitely. Well, you know, there's always a, a little bit of room for error. Uh, MMA is a pretty forgiving sport, but, you know, it's a very interesting time in the, in the, uh, in the lightweight division right now with Frank Yeager stealing the title or taking the title away from uh, from BJ, it really changes the face of the whole division, you know, because now it's very difficult, you know, to say who's the number one guy. Is it is it still BJ Penn? Is right. it Frankie Yeager? Is it Gray Maynard who's beat Frankie Yeager? It's right. it's a you know it's tough and it really opens up a lot of doors and I think it's it's really going to be interesting to see how this division plays out in the next few months to to a year. Right. How surprised were you with that victory for Frankie Yeager? Um, I was, you know, I did not, I did not pick that win, that <laughs> him to win that fight. Him. I did not pick him to win that fight. But um, you know, you got to give the guy credit. He, I don't right. think I've seen anyone come in with as smart of a game plan to fight to fight BJ Penn. He stood and kick, kickboxed with him and wore him down. And and once he did wear him down, down, that's when he went for the takedowns. You know, we've seen other guys who, you know, on paper may even be better fighters than Frankie Edgar right. that have just come in and, and not come in with the right you know, right game plan to fight BJ Penn. You know, you can, he's not a guy you can press up against the cage and, or, or take down with a single leg. You gotta wear him down and then you gotta shoot that power double. That's a, the only way you're gonna get him down and that's, you know, and, and Frank Yeager fought a, a brilliant fight against him. Right, now, speaking of the mind of a fighter again, is it, do you think most guys beat themselves when they face like a champion like per se a BJ Penn before they even get in there? Do you think they're beat as they're walking to the cage? Um, I think it happens sometimes, but I think that's uh, part of one of the challenges of being a high-level fighter. You right. know, you have to learn to. Uh, you know, it's 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 kind of a cliche thing to to say, but it's really 90% mental. This sport. You know, if your if your head's not in the right place, you've 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 lost before you've stepped in the cage. Right. So you know, a big part of it is 
going out there with the right mentality and you know not over overthinking things and and just trusting in your training trusting in your coaches trusting in yourself right now that the bullseye is on frankie's back as opposed to bj's do you think there could be a tendency for some fighters in the division to say oh now wait a minute maybe there is a chance here that i can take this i mean that's a dangerous approach to there, take. yeah definitely definitely you know there's a lot of guys uh, you know, he's got the title right now, and, and, you know, there's a lot of guys that may not have been the best matchup to fight a guy like BJ Penn that, you know, are just stylistically it matches up much better. And that's one of the interesting things about MMA is, you know, it's st styles make fights. So if you get a, a champion who has a different style than, you know, the past dominant champion like BJ Penn, then, uh, you know, it opens up a whole lot of doors for a lot of guys. Well, to get back to your fight, what kind of doors do you think will be open with a win over Jeremy Stevens? I mean, if you could play matchmaker, who would, where would you put yourself in the division after a win? Um, you know, to, to be honest with you, I haven't really even, even thought about uh, a next opponent after Jeremy Stevens. I think that's, uh, you know, kind of an arrogant thing to do is, is start thinking <laughs> about stuff like that before you've, before you've, you know, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. But, exactly. um, you know, in, in terms of my career, I'm ready to just, um, you know, keep stacking wins and keep, and keep you know, put, fighting the guys that the UFC wants me to fight. Absolutely. Don't worry about Dave. He's always trying to air, you know, get people to air the dirty laundry and, 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 and you look four or five fights down the road. You know, that's what he wants you to, to say. You know, he'd, he'd probably like you to say there's some 16-year-old kid right now that's, uh, that's wrestling in high school that, that, that you're going to fight in five years. But, uh, you know, you mentioned the fact you come into the UFC at a very young age and, you know, not only fighting-wise but attitude-wise, you know, there's a lot of growth. You know, Team Tompkins now with Vitor and, and yourself, I mean, do you also feel a sense of uh, responsibility to Team Tompkins? Um, I think I'm one of the, one of the, you know, I'm one of the f main ambassadors for Team Tompkins. I've been here, you know, really for a long time training with Sean since, basically since he started training guys for MMA, I've been been training with them and you know even before that with kickboxing and and uh you know he's not only my coach but he's my brother so uh right. i know i got to represent him well and uh and all my teammates well because they're you know they're all like brothers to me so um anything that i do reflects on them right right all right sam well we appreciate you taking some time you were doing a little training on it quite a contraption over there i don't what do you call that i've never seen something i don't like even that. know what it's called it's uh, just a resistance uh you know, resistance pulley system that uh, makes it a little diff more difficult to do a lot of exercises. <laughs> oh yeah, the hardest part looked like just putting it together. Yeah, you know, I don't even know how they do that. Yeah, it takes a little time to get to get all hooked up in there. Exactly. I think people could go to the uh, the website here or Team Tom because they can actually uh, check you out yep. uh, working on us, that uh, thing. Watch some some of our training secrets there. <laughs> exactly. I'll air it after the fight. But uh, we appreciate you coming on. Obviously, best of luck uh, in Montreal next weekend. We'll be out there and. Uh, We'll be cheering you on, definitely. Thanks for having me. All right, Sam Stout, everybody with the UFC. We'll be right back here in Between Rounds for Heavy.com. All right, welcome back to Between Rounds here for Heavy.com. And uh, another guest, we've got John Gunderson, UFC fighter here with us, who traveled all the way to Abu Dhabi at UFC 112 and was uh, unable to fight due to his opponent, correct? That's true. What happened? From what I understand, he just... Um May have cut too much weight, wasn't feeling good, and was up all night with migraines. And the day of the fight, about an hour and a half before the fight started, we were on the bus to the arena, and they pulled uh, Sean Tompkins, my coach, off. But now that was a little, like, scary, right? I mean, people are like, why are these officials pulling Tompkins off the bus? I, there, was two, there was only two things I could think of at the time. <laughs> the first thing that came to mind was that uh, two of my buddies that, well, there was four of us in the room, and... Three of the guys had gone uh, across the street at a little pool party and threw a, uh, one of the princes in the pool having a little bit of fun. Oh, so that was, so the one, that was the one thing. That was the can. first thing that was, because we were, you know, obviously in Abu Dhabi, so I was, didn't know if they were going to chop our heads off for that or <laughs> what was going to happen. And then, of course, the other thing was, uh, you know, maybe something happened at home with my family. Those were the only two things I, you know, I thought of. Right. On the way to the fight, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You would think anything that had to do with the fight would have been... Yeah. Taking care of our I already seen him at Wayne's. I thought everything was good to go. Right. Um, and Sean comes on the bus a couple minutes later and tells me, you know, the fight's off. So, 
Well, but then it's on again now, right? Yep, it's on again. They've, they've just announced that you'll fight Paul Taylor at the Ultimate Fighter finale mm -hmm. at the Palms uh, June 9th, I believe. June 19th. 19th. June 19th. And, uh, I mean, what do you do? <laughs> it's, it's like, uh, do you go back to the drawing board and start all over, yeah, or what I mean, do you do? It, in my opinion, it's better for me now because now I don't have to travel. Um, right. I live here in Vegas. I train here in Vegas. He's got to travel a lot further than he had to to Abu Dhabi. Right. He's got to cut the weight again. So, and he's got to deal with not showing up last time. I showed up, I was ready to fight. <laughs> exactly. So, it's the same game plan, and he just gives me another two months to prepare for him, so. Right. Especially given the fact that you traveled all the way to Abu Dhabi for that fight, what was it like? I mean, obviously it was a disappointment, but, I mean, as a fighter, you, you know, you're, it's, it's game day, it's time to go. What is that like to find out fights off like that? I don't even know how to explain that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I don't know, it was like, I was, I was blowing up a balloon for about a year, and all of a sudden, someone walked by and popped it. I was, I was ready to go. Um, I was mentally, in, you know, just set to fight, and right. to find that out, I was just, it was, a, it was a big letdown because, I mean, I got my money, but that's not, that's not where I really want, right. wanted to right. go there. I wanted to go there to fight, and, you know, every, every man and every fighter has a, a legacy to set of his own, and, you know, that was, that was one step towards mine, so... I'll get to redeem myself and, you know, come back here and, and show what I can do on the 19th of June. Well, as far as your experience in Abu Dhabi, obviously it was a disappointment without being able to fight, but what was it like there? I, mean, I, I didn't like it. I wouldn't <laughs> want to go back. I didn't, I didn't like it at all. It was hot, um, you know, and I was going there to fight, so I didn't get to experience anything. I didn't get, didn't get to travel and have a lot of fun around there. I, right. I, I don't know what the city looks like. I just know there's a lot of buildings that are not completely built and... You know, a lot of money being wasted there. But. <laughs> well, now, speaking of which, was it before or after the fight was canceled that you got your laundry bill? <laughs> it was before. It was, I think it was probably three days before. Really? So it was just one thing after another then? <laughs> yes, yes, it was. What exactly happened? You go to get your laundry done, and you find out? Well, it's half, half me and my, and my uh, training partner's fault. We, we need to get some laundry done. We've been there, you know, we're spending there, I think, eight days there, so... Of course, you don't bring everything that you need. You need to get some laundry done. So we looked at the list, and, you know, we were like, ah, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Right. And when one of the ladies walked by that works there, and we were like, hey, you know, can we get this laundry done? We couldn't understand what she said. She couldn't understand what we said. So we <laughs> thought we were getting one over on her. Right. We were like, yeah, yeah, do it. You know, cheap, cheap. Give us a good right. deal. Right. So we were, you know, thought it was a good deal. And uh, the next day, <laughs> they bring the laundry all pressed and folded, and all it was was workout clothes. Right. You know. Five dollar shirts, and they bring it back, and they came out to two hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> yeah. Wow! Yeah, eight hundred and something Durham is what it. So you would have done some shopping instead. Yeah, and when we did everything we could to try to get it cheaper, but, but there, no one was having it. No. no. <laughs> we thought we could talk our way out of it, but it didn't. Try to give the bill to Dana White? No. <laughs> no. No. Definitely not. <laughs> not at all. Yeah. All right, John. Well, obviously, we're going to look forward to the fight uh, that we were going to see. Uh, I think you're right. I think you might have the advantage here uh, mentally anyway because of the, of the fact that uh, he's going to be coming off some issues and uh, he's got a long way to travel. Uh, we'll be at the Ultimate Fighter, so hopefully we'll get you on maybe that week and uh, get you back here and, and get your thoughts before the fight. Sounds good. All right. John Gunderson, UFC fighter. We'll be right back here in between rounds for Heavy.com.